Welcome back to Charlotte Mason's Volumes. I'm Min, and today we are going to continue in Ourselves, Book 1. We will be reading Part 2, Chapters 1 and 2. The House of Mind, Chapter 1. Ourselves, a vast country not yet explored. When we think of our bodies and of the wonderful powers they possess, we say under our breath, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Now let us consider that still more wonderful self, which we cannot see and touch as we can our bodies, but which thinks and loves and prays to God, which is happy or sad, good or not good. This inner self is, as we have said, like a vast country, much of which is not yet explored, or like a great house built as a maze in which you cannot find your way about. People usually talk of ourselves as made up of body, mind, heart, and soul. And we will do the same, because it is a convenient way to describe us. It is more convenient to say, the sun rises at six and sets at nine, than to say, as the earth turns round daily before the sun, that part of the earth on which we live first gets within sight of the sun about six o'clock in the morning in March. The sun rises and sets is a better way of describing this, not only because it is easier to say, but because it is what we all appear to see and to know. In the same way, everybody appears to know about his own heart and soul and mind. Though perhaps the truth is that there is no division into parts, but that the whole of each of us has many different powers and does many different things at different times. Self-control, self-knowledge, self-reverence. It would even seem as if we had two inside selves, one which wishes to do a wrong or unwise thing, and another which says, you must not. And one of the great things we have to learn in life is how, where, and when to use this power, which we call self-control. Before we can have true self-control, we must know a good deal about ourselves. That is, we must get self-knowledge. Many persons think themselves quite different from everybody else, which is a mistake. Self-knowledge teaches that what is true of everybody else is true of us also. And when we come to know how wonderful are the powers and how immense are the possibilities of man's soul, we are filled not with pride, but with self-reverence, which includes reverence and pity for the meanest and most debased, because each of these is also a great man's soul, though it may be a man's soul neglected, ruined, or decayed. The government of man's soul is, as we know, the chief business of man, and we will go on to consider the members of the government. Chapter 2. My Lord Intellect Introduces Mansoul to Delightful Realms To begin with, my Lord Intellect. He is the foreign secretary because he conducts affairs and establishes relations with many foreign kingdoms. Through him, Mansoul obtains the freedom of rich provinces and mighty states. Science, a vast and joyous region. Science is one of these provinces. Here the stars are measured, the ocean sounded, and the wind made the servant of man. Here every flower that blooms reveals the secret of its growth, and every grain of sand recounts its history. This is a vast and joyous realm, for the people who walk therein are always discovering new things, and each new thing is a delight, because the things are not a medley, but each is a part of the great whole. So immense is the realm of science that one of the wisest and greatest travelers therein who had discovered many things said, when he was an old man, that he was only like a little child playing with pebbles on the beach. Do you too wish to walk in the pleasant ways of science? My Lord Intellect will give you the necessary introductions and do everything to make your progress easy. Imagination cheers the traveler here. I should have mentioned that Intellect's colleague, my Lord Imagination, Chief Explorer, you recollect him, usually journeys with travelers in the ways of science and cheers them by opening up fresh and delightful vistas before their eyes. History, a pleasant place. History is another glorious domain in which my Lord Intellect holds the key and sends forth imagination by way of courier and companion to the zealous traveler. Of all the pleasant places in the world of mind, I do not know that any are more delightful than those in the domain of history. Have you ever looked through a kinetoscope? Many figures are there, living and moving, dancing, walking in procession, whatever they happen to be doing at the time the picture was taken. 
History is a little like that, only much more interesting, because in these curious living photographs, the figures are very small and rather dim, and most attentive gazing cannot make them clearer. Now, history shows you its personages, clothed as they were clothed, moving, looking, speaking as they looked, moved and spoke, engaged in serious matters or in pleasures, and the longer you look at any one person, the more clearly he stands out until at last he may become more real to you than the people who live in your own home. The Shows of History Think of all the centuries and of every country full of a great procession of living, moving people. Think of the little byways of history where you see curious things that bring you very near to the people concerned, like that letter from a little boy in Egypt some 4,000 years ago, in which he tells his father that he won't be good or do his lessons unless his father takes him to the great festival that is coming on. Even little boys in Egypt 4,000 years ago were not, it appears, all good. Here we see Alcibiades going about the streets of Athens, handsome, witty, and winning, reckless and haughty, and so far without principle that not even Socrates could make him good. Or we see the king, Henry VIII, walking arm in arm with Sir Thomas More in his garden at Chelsea, and his dear daughter Margaret hovering around and bringing her father sugar plums when the king had gone. We are making history. We see, too, the working people, the smith at his forge, the plowman in the field, the maypole on the village green with the boys and girls dancing around it. Once intellect admits us into the realms of history, we live in a great and stirring world full of entertainment and sometimes of regret. And at last, we begin to understand that we, too, are making history and that we are all part of the whole. That the people who went before us were all very like ourselves or else we should not be able to understand them. If some of them were worse than we, and in some things their times were worse than ours, yet we make acquaintance with many who were noble and great, and our hearts beat with a desire to be like them. That helps us to understand our own times. We see that we, too, live in a great age and a great country, in which there is plenty of room for heroes. And if these should be heroes in a quiet way whom the world never hears of, that does not make much real difference. No one was ever the least heroic or good, but an immense number of people were the better for it. Indeed, it has been said that the whole world is the better for every dutiful life, and will be so until the end of time. We cannot be at home in history without imagination. But we must read history and think about it to understand how these things can be, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to the historians of whom Herodotus has been called the father, who called in imagination to picture for them the men and events of the past about which they had read and searched diligently, so that everything seemed to take place again before their eyes and they were able to write of it for us. But their seeing and writing is not of much use to us unless, in our case, Lord Intellect invites imagination to go forth with him, and we think of things and figure them to ourselves until at last they are real and alive to us. Mathematics, a mountainous land. Another realm open to intellect has an uninviting name, and traveling therein is difficult, what with steep faces of rock to climb and deep ravines to cross. The principality of mathematics is a mountainous land, but the air is very fine and health-giving, though some people find it too rare for their breathing. It differs from most mountainous countries in this, that you cannot lose your way and that every step taken is on firm ground. People who seek their work or play in this principality find themselves braced by effort and satisfied with truth. Intellect now and then calls for the aid of imagination as he travels here, but not often. My Lord Attorney General Reason is his chosen comrade. Philosophy explores Mansoul. Another domain which opens interesting prospects to intellect is that of fair philosophy, a domain with which we are a little acquainted already, for it is that of Mansoul, with its mountain heights, its dark forests, its unexplored regions. Philosophy offers fascinating and delightful traveling, and the wayfarer here learns many lessons of life, but he does not find the same firm foothold as he whose way leads him through the principality of mathematics. Still, certainty is not the best thing in the world. To search, to endeavor, and to feel our way to a foothold from point to point is also exhilarating, and every step that is gained is a resting place and a house of ease for man's soul. 
literature a very rich and glorious kingdom. Perhaps the least difficult of approach, and certainly one of the most joyous and satisfying of all those realms in which intellect is invited to travel, is a very rich and glorious kingdom of literature. Intellect cannot walk here without imagination, and also he does well to have at his other side that colleague of his whom we will call the beauty sense. It is a great thing to be accustomed to good society, and when intellect walks abroad in this fair kingdom, he becomes intimate with the best of all ages and all countries. Poets and novelists paint pictures for him while imagination clears his eyes so that he is able to see those pictures. They fill the world, too, with deeply interesting and delightful people who live out their lives before his eyes. He has a multitude of acquaintances and some friends who tell him all their secrets. He knows Miranda and the melancholy Jacques and the terrible Lady Macbeth, Fenella and that fair maid of Perth, and a great many people, no two alike, live in his thoughts. How to Recognize Literature Observe, there is a poor place close at hand, where pictures are painted for you and where people are introduced, but you cannot see the pictures with your eyes shut, and the people do not live and act in your thoughts. There is as much difference between this region outside and that within the kingdom of literature as there is between a panorama and the real beautiful country it is intended to portray. It is a horrible waste of time to wander about in this outside region, yet many people spend a large part of their lives there and never once get within sight of the beauties and delights within the kingdom of literature. There is another test besides the two of scenes that you see and people that you know, which distinguishes literature from the barren land on its borders. And if he is to apply this test, intellect must keep his beauty sense always by his side. Read over and see if you find a difference of flavor, shall I say, between the two passages that follow. Try if the first gives you a sense of delight in the words alone, without any thought of the meaning of them, if the very words seem to sing to you. That time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang, upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs, where late the sweet birds sang. Now read the next passage. Household deities, then only shall be happiness on earth when man shall feel your sacred power and love, your tranquil joys. Can you perceive that, though the second passage is true, thoughtful, and well expressed, it just misses a certain charm in the wording which makes words go home to our heart with living power? If you cannot see any difference in value between these two passages, perhaps you will do so some day. The thing is to keep your eye upon words and wait to feel their force and beauty. And when words are so fit that no other words can be put in their places, so few that none can be left out without spoiling the sense, and so fresh and musical that they delight you, then you may be sure that you are reading literature, whether in prose or poetry. A great deal of delightful literature can be recognized only by this test. Our Beauty Sense There is another region open to intellect of very great beauty and delight. He must needs have imagination with him to travel there, but still more must he have that companion of the nice ear and eye who enabled him to recognize music and beauty in words and their arrangement. The aesthetic sense, in truth, holds the key of this palace of delights. There are few joys in life greater and more constant than our joy in beauty, though it is almost impossible to put into words what beauty consists in. Color, form, proportion, harmony, these are some of its elements. Words give some idea of these things, and therefore some idea of beauty, and that is why it is only through our beauty sense that we can take full pleasure in literature. Beauty in Nature but beauty is everywhere, in white clouds against the blue, in the gray bowl of the beach, the play of a kitten, the lovely flight, and beautiful coloring of birds, in the hills and the valleys and the streams, in the wind flower and the blossom of the broom. What we call nature is all beauty and delight, and the person who watches nature closely and knows her well, like the poet Wordsworth, for example, has his beauty sense always active, always bringing him joy. We cannot get away from beauty, and we delight in it most perhaps in the faces and forms of many little children 
and of some grown-up people. The Palace of Art We take pleasure, too, in the arrangement and coloring of a nice room, of a nice dress, in the cover of a book, in the iron fittings of a door, when these are what is called artistic. This brings us to another world of beauty created for us by those whose beauty sense enables them not only to see and take joy in all the beauty there is, but whose souls become so filled with the beauty they gather through eye and ear that they produce for us new forms of beauty in picture, statue, glorious cathedral, in delicate ornament, in fugue, sonata, simple melody. When we think for a moment how we must admire the goodness of God in placing us in a world so exceedingly full of beauty, whether it be of what we call nature or of what we call art, and in giving us that sense of beauty which enables us to see and hear, and to be, as it were, suffused with pleasure at a single beautiful effect brought to our ear or our eye. The Hall of Simulation But, like all the good gifts we have received, this too is capable of neglect and misuse. It is not enough that there should be a beauty world always within reach. We must see to it that our beauty sense is on the alert and keep quick to discern. We may easily be all our lives like that man of whom the poet says, A primrose by the river's brim, a yellow primrose was to him, was that and nothing more. That is, he missed the subtle sense of beauty which lay not so much in the primrose nor in the river, but rather in the fact of the primrose growing just there. Our great danger is that, as there is a barren country reaching up to the very borders of the kingdom of literature, so too is there a dull and dreary hole of simulation which we may enter and believe it to be the palace of art. Here people are busy painting, carving, modeling, and whatnot. The very son labors here with his photographs, and he is as good an artist as the rest, and better, for the notion in this hall is that the object of art is to make things exactly like life. So the so-called artists labor away to get the color and form of the things they see, and to paint these on canvas or shape them in marble or model them in wax, flowers, and all the time they miss, because they do not see that subtle presence which we call beauty in the objects they paint and mold. Many persons allow themselves to be deceived in this matter and go through life without ever entering the palace of art and perceiving but little of the beauty of nature. We all have need to be trained to see and to have our eyes opened before we can take in the joy that is meant for us in this beautiful life. The Intellectual Life I cannot tell you more now of the delightful and illimitable sources of pleasure open to intellect and his colleagues, but if you realize at all what has been said, you will be surprised to know that many people live within narrow bounds and rarely step into either of the great worlds we have been considering. The happiness of the intellectual life comes of knowing and thinking, imagining and perceiving, or rather comes of the range of things which we know and think about, imagine and perceive. Everybody's mind is occupied in these ways about something or other, but many people know and think about small matters. It is quite well to think of these for a little while, but they think about them always and have no room for the great thoughts which great things bring to us. Thus, a boy's head may be so full of his stamp collection or of the next cricket match that there is no room in it for bigger things. The stamps and the cricket are all right, but it is not all right by any means to miss the opportunities of great interest that come to us and pass unnoticed while we think only of these small matters. Not only so, boys and girls may be so full of marks and places, prizes and scholarships that they never see that their studies are meant to unlock the door for them into this or that region of intellectual joy and interest. School and college over, their books are shut forever. When they become men and women, they still live among narrow interests with hardly an outlook upon the wide world, past or present. This is to be the slaves of knowledge and not its joyful masters. Let it be said of us as it was of the late Bishop of London. His was the rare gift of mastering knowledge as a splendid servant, not being himself mastered by it as its weary slave.